Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanko and Scott Parkin. Hi, everybody. This is Bob Bazanko from the Green and Red Podcast. Scott's not here tonight. But uh, wanted to talk to uh, one of our most frequent guests, one of our favorite people, Mike Elk. Uh, Mike is the founder and senior labor editor of Payday Report, which is really a, a fantastic resource for tracking labor organizing and strikes and things like that. But tonight, Mike is here uh, in another capacity. You've also, especially over the last few years, uh, been covering uh, political events in Brazil pretty deeply. Um, a couple of years ago, you were there for Lula's election in late 2022. And since then, you've been actively involved in it. And some big news happened today uh, in Brazil, uh, something that uh, has kind of been an ongoing um, story really since uh, Lula's election, which in which his predecessor, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, tried to, to you know upend the election. And since then, there's been this ongoing political dispute. And today, um, there was a fairly significant development in that. So you want to just kind of Give us a little background and tell us what's going on. So, so what happened is that in um, 2022, uh, I was there in Brazil. Lula, you know, who was a former auto workers union leader, narrowly won uh, re-election. Lula won election. He had been elected two times prior, uh, 2002, 2006. And Jair Bolsonaro, who called himself the Trump of the tropics, had been president uh, from 2018, 2022. So, uh, you know, Lula won by a little over a, a percentage and a half. Um, and immediately, you know, Bolsonaro started making noise about how the election was rigged and all this stuff. Uh, and it was very scary. Uh, however, there were international observers. There's actually an independent federal election commission that's chaired by the Supreme Court in Brazil. They all certified the election and said that didn't happen. So what happens is that Bolsonaro uh, got desperate. Um, there were various plots, various schemes. Uh, one of the most curious things that occurred was a few hours before, um, you know, a, a day or two before uh, Lula was set to take office, Bolsonaro took off for Orlando, Florida, uh, and was famously pictured while Lula was taking office. He refused to hand over the presidential sash to Lula, was famously pictured in a KFC in Orlando, because uh, that's a good place for fascists to hang out, I guess, at a KFC in Orlando. That's where uh, they feel comfortable. You know, that's kind of, a, I guess, a fascist hangout spot. Uh, so anyhow, uh, they they uh, went to, he, you know, he went to this KFC and it was very curious and he didn't come back to Brazil for three months, which was very opposite behavior of Trump, who was out there rallying up crowds and telling people to march on the Capitol and and, and do all this stuff. Um, and so... Um, what wind up happening is that um, they, they it, it was very curious. People didn't quite understand why. Obviously, Bolsonaro was in trouble for various crimes. Now it has come out that Bolsonaro attempted a coup. Uh, and we know this in various ways. One, they recorded it via Zoom. Uh, <laughs> just FYI, we're going to pull a, a coup. So they had a meeting where they didn't get into details, but they talked about challenging the electoral integrity and, you know, trying to overturn the results. Uh, two, what happened is there were a variety of things that Bolsonaro got in trouble for. And one of them was that he forged his COVID card to enter the U.S., to the United Nations. Uh, and he had, he relied on underlings to help him do it, including uh, a Lieutenant Colonel Mario Cid. And the other thing he got in trouble for was he received these Rolex watches in violation of ethics laws in Brazil, and then sold them to some pawn shop in the suburbs of Philly. Uh, and so what happened is they went to this guy, Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Sid, and they said, um, you know, we know you forged these cards, and we know you tried to sell these watches. You're going to do a couple of years in jail. Sid uh, then then flipped on Lula. Um, Sid then flipped on, on Bolsonaro, I mean. And told the beans and told the whole story that Bolsonaro had been working with his vice presidential candidate, Brego Neto, who was a minister of defense, and with the head of his party, the PL, uh, to, to have a plan that would assassinate Lula. And five special forces soldiers, including a brigadier general who was the executive secretary 
of of Bolsonaro were arrested this week. Uh, and today, 36 of the top aides of Bolsonaro were charged in this scheme. Now, what's important to bring up here is that this was not done by the Lula administration, the charging. The Brazilian Supreme Court has jurisdiction to go out and charge people. So it's actually a guy by the name of Alexander G. Moraes, who was appointed by uh, the the center right uh, successor, the predecessor to Bolsonaro, uh, Tamer Michael Tamar, and was considered a centrist figure. Uh, Moraes was also someone who was targeted. They were going to kill Lula, Moraes, and Gerard Acumin, and then they were going to take over. Uh, as of today, you know Lula is leading in all the re-election pools. He's very, very popular in Brazil. He has achieved a number of measures, including tax reform, increased social investment, and just well as being a force of personality, a Mandela type figure in Brazil. And so today they uh, announced that they were indicting Bolsonaro along with 36 of his top aides. Uh, this is unprecedented. No former president in the history of Brazil has ever been charged with trying to orchestrate a coup. Now, this happened at the same time that Lula was hosting the G20 uh, without um, you know, any kind of leadership in the United States and very centrist leaderships in Europe, without a doubt, Lula is the most left-leading figure in the world right now. Uh, I've joked that he's literally the leader of the free world and someone that when we resist neoliberalism around the world is going to be looked to for this. Yeah. Now, I think there's a lot of lessons, right? Having an independent judiciary that could go out and charge these guys with these crimes that was independent of any political pressure certainly played a role. Uh, we saw Merrick Garland as attorney general dither and punt on charging Trump with similar crimes and disqualifying them from running again. In Brazil, the top of Bolsonaro's leadership of his party is all gone, as well as a lot of the top aides. And they don't have any juice at this point. I mean, who wants to do a favor for someone about to go to jail? That's a pretty hard thing. Yeah. So as a result of having an independent judicial system in Brazil, we're seeing that justice is being done, that, you know, and Lula has been able to come out and say, hey, I had nothing to do with this. This was not my appointee. This was the Supreme Court. And I think there's a lot of lessons for Americans here. We did not do this in this country, and it was a mistake. Yeah. Well, there's so much about that uh, that I think is really, really uh, important. One, they acted decisively. I mean, these investigations began pretty much, you know, immediately. So, you know, as you pointed out, Garland waited like two years just to kind of get this going. And then he punts and he gets a, a special prosecutor. The other thing that always stood out, though, is um, this began o over a forged COVID card and, and selling watches at a pawn shop. Right. I mean, these are like kind of you know, street crimes in the U.S. But what's really stunning is that Trump, I mean, did so much more than this on a daily basis. Like he's just like lining his own pockets and he's taking care of his family and, you know, trying to get people, uh, political opponents, uh, get rid of them and so forth. Right. And so it's really striking. I think that Brazil acted so quickly on and it took seriously these things like like, you know, forging a, a, an official document, whereas Trump apparently stole documents. Right. Well, I think part of that is, look, Brazilian democracy is much younger. Brazilian democracy is younger than I am. Uh, the Constitution of Brazil was written in 1988 after the dictatorship yeah. fell. So in Brazil, there's a sense that democracy is a very fragile thing. I think here in America, a lot of people take it for granted that it's always existed and it's always going to exist. Uh, we'll see in the next few or that, or years. That it's gone and there's nothing they can do about it. You know? Yeah. Uh, we'll see in the next few years. And I think yeah. you have a leader like Lula who comes from the working class who has a force of personality, who comes out of the trade union movement, you know, where they shut down uh, factories and all kind of stuff. Uh, I think that is a very big difference from what you see here. You have a generation such as your generation uh, that were out in the streets, uh, that were, you know, shutting down auto factories, that were, you know, protesting for the right to vote. You do not have that in the United States. So I think, I think we're going to see quite... Uh, a fight ahead of us. The frustrating thing for me uh, is that obviously Lula is a very inspiring leader. You know, he's a trade unionist. Uh, he, he's, you know, done stuff 
uh, that I think has really uh, helped helped uh, the country a lot. I mean, he, he, yeah. he cut poverty in half in the country. He doubled the number of people going to college for free. Uh, he introduced affirmative action. So he has very deep roots and he's been able to communicate directly to the working class, uh, which we've failed to do in this past election. And so I hope that somehow Americans are able to pay attention to it. A big part of the problem is you don't even really see many publications on the left in the United States talking about this. Yeah. Occasionally, there might be a professor or someone like that who puts an op-ed in a publication uh, and gets something in a publication, but there's no serious coverage. I mean, we try to do something once or twice a month simply because it's my interest area. And I think this is a real flaw of Americans. If we're going to survive this period of fascism, we are going to have to look to international solidarity for support because we are going to get exhausted here in the United States. Well, you know, going to get... oh, I mean, um, Mex in Mexico, you had a, kind of similar circumstances. Maybe, you know, AMLO wasn't as far out there to the left. Uh, but, you know, in Mexico, you actually had uh, laws, programs, policies that help normal working people. And so, you know, that party won, again, fairly easily. In the U.S., I mean, not that you need a great person, a great hero, but there's no one comparable to Lula here in the U.S. I mean, Bernie Sanders doesn't have that same real working class background. He's from this liberal state up in the Northeast. So there's really no one even close to that, right? In the U.S., you don't really have anybody. Who... Yeah, and there's been some talk, you know, Jimmy Williams of the Painter Union came out and said, you know, we ought to, um, we ought to have a union leader run for office. Yeah. And I don't think that's a bad idea. I think we have to get outside of the traditional box of what a politician looks like. Certainly the Republican Party did that with Trump. Uh, and, and one of the doubts I have about Trump is, does Trumpism survive after Trump is gone? Yeah. Uh, is J.D. Vance going to be able to pick up the mantle? I, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but he's no Trump. I mean, yeah. for all of Trump's flaws, and I think the guy's a con man, he is charismatic. He, he does tell jokes well. He, you know, knows how to push buttons the way a shock jock does. Uh, and I'm not certain they have someone on their bench. But I think what we have to think about right now is that we have four years ahead of us that are going to be a tough, tough fight. And we need to look for all the inspiration we can get. And I certainly think Lula is a source of inspiration that can help us in that time. Yeah, and I think that's really a good lesson there. You know, they acted decisively. They immediately began to investigate this. Um, Merrick Garland was kind of the unsung hero of the Republican Party in 2024. He, 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 they couldn't have asked for anybody better. You know, I've never heard Trump publicly attack Garland. He attacks everybody, every judge, every lawyer. But I've never heard him say anything about Garland. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't listen that closely. But the fact is, I think everybody understood he was actually like really kind of helping them out. And so when you, you know, when I saw this today, I mean, 36 people. So this is essentially the entire, you know, upper structure of, of Bolsonaro's political party, I'm assuming. It's pretty much been wiped out. It's the upper structure of his political party and most of his allies in the military. Yeah. So if you go to jail, he's eliminating the long-term threat. This yeah. is a major Brazilian democracy. And it comes as Brazil is hosting the G20, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we saw all kind of photos in Brazil of Lula meeting and hugging the Chinese. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. right now, he does not have a friend at the Trump administration. The right. Trump administration is try to help all the right wing forces. Oh, so yeah, yeah. the fact that they went and made these indictments and took away their passports and made it so they couldn't travel the country was crucial. They did it now because if they waited for Trump to come in, Trump could have given them asylum. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I see them, I mean, I mean, unless Bolsonaro is somehow able to escape the country, he did at one point when he thought he was going to get indicted earlier this year. I mean, there are multiple stories. One time, the Brazilian police showed up and they raided his son's house. Uh, and an hour or two beforehand, they just so happened to go decide to go fishing at five in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and who knows what they were doing out on that boat, right? And then on another occasion... Bolsonaro just so happened to check into the Hungarian embassy for a couple of days just to hang out because, you know, you can claim asylum there. Victor Orban, yeah. Uh, so the options are limited here. Uh, and I think 
as Americans, we really need to start looking at internationalism in this period, particularly when you look at countries like Brazil or Portugal that have gone through dictatorship. The only thing we have left at this time is the popularity of unions. Uh, you know, we have an ability with the filibuster and the tight margins in the House to maybe win a few delaying fights, maybe win a few fights here or there. Uh, but unions are still at 70% popularity. Are they going to strike in a mass way? I mean, Sean Fain of the UAW is talking about striking in 2028. What about striking if they try to repeal Obamacare? What about striking if they're mass deportations? Yeah. Are they going to do that? Uh, I think is a big question. And I think that's precisely why we need to look for countries like Brazil, where they've done that thing and they've stopped authoritarianism through it. Yeah. Well, especially here, uh, you know, the unions right now kind of are going to have to lead the resistance because we don't have, you know, we had four years of Biden. And to me, the point of that was you organize, but I don't think that much organization took place. It did, you know, some of these unions, but, you know, now we've got, we're back in the same situation where we're, you know, probably even further behind. So that's why, you know, what happened in Brazil really is inspiring and to just wipe out like the entire structure of that. It's really crazy. You know, look at here, you know, like they made it clear from the beginning, Trump was the only person they were interested in. They went after like low level functionary, you know, not even functionary, just people who happened to be there on January 6th. They kind of went after Trump and then they didn't even touch. They didn't even bring up people like Hawley and Ted Cruz and Tom Cotton and Marjorie Taylor Greene, all these other people probably participated in it. So everybody, it was clear from the beginning, everybody could walk and there was no reason to fear Garland or Jack Smith or the Democratic Party. And so seeing this is really encouraging because, you know, as, as you can see right now, I mean, there's there's clearly Latin America is within the sights again. You know, they made it clear already about like Venezuela and Cuba. Cuba's in the worst shape it's been in probably in over 30 years. And obviously, you know, Lula, the goal there, I think, is to isolate him and AMLO and people like that. And Trump's talked about sending the military to Mexico, so who the hell knows? But it's an important story. Um, were these people or any of these people in any way, like even peripherally connected to the Mariel Franco murder and that investigation? Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of questions about the So the police chief of Rio de Janeiro uh, was charged uh, in the murder for plotting it. Right. Now, the day before Mary Ellie was assassinated, he was appointed the police chief by Ragger Neto, who was the vice presidential right. of Bolsonaro, uh, who at the time was the minister of defense. And Neto, um, Neto was involved in this plot uh, about the coup, about killing Lula. There's a lot of questions about what Neto might have known about um, this situation uh, regarding Marielle Franco. Uh, it's important to note that, uh, you know, the, the killer in the case lived in the same condo complex as Bolsonaro. Their children had dated. They knew each other at one point in some crazy uh, gang tur turf war. The, the gunman's leg was blown off and Bolsonaro got him a free prosthetic leg. Oh, geez. Yeah. So uh, there's been a lot of questions about what they know. Uh, there's certainly a lot of speculation that they covered it up. Uh, but I will say this about Marielle Franco. If you did not have the vigilance you had after she was a Rio City Councilwoman who was assassinated in 2018. If you did not have that level of militants after she was assassinated for five years fighting, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if there would be the same taste, thirst for justice in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, I think they certainly heightened it. They certainly showed the degree of involvement. And they definitely showed that the state in Brazil was willing to go after their political actors. So I think it, it is an interesting parallel. Uh, there's going to be more trials there. The gunmen in the case were just uh, convicted. The driver and the gunmen were just convicted. That is moving forward. Uh, her wife, her widow, Monica Benicius, was just reelected to city council overwhelmingly for another four-year term. Uh, so it'll be interesting because, you know, as someone who who's lived in Brazil at various times and likes to go down there for a month or two a year, it's hard to look at this country and look at Brazil and look at Brazil pulling away, you know, and, and really fighting hard against fascism because they know what fascism is. They experienced it 30 Five, 
you know, 40 years ago in Brazil, and they've experienced elements of it since. Uh, we're going to have to really do some deep digging here and look inside ourselves and find inspiration because that's the only choice we have right now is to fight. Well, this is the 60th anniversary of the 1964 coup. So um, a yeah, yeah. couple more things because uh, we'll keep this short. Um, one, um, are there one of the next elections? I know you said a national election in 2026, but are there kind of local elections or statewide elections or anything before that? The local elections were this year. Uh, in Rio, a centrist guy by the name of Edward pa pa Pius won um, the mayoral ship. In Sao Paulo, the largest city in Latin America, a right-wing ally of Bolsonaro was wiped out, and he won with 60% uh, against a, a left-wing ally of Lula. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's still going to be a tough fight. Lula, though looks to be in great health. He makes videos where he goes out jogging and he's 77 years old. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he's, you know, a pretty spiffy guy. I saw him speak at a rally four or five months ago in, in Rio. And he looked full of energy, uh, totally the opposite of, of Biden. Uh, so <laughs> it is conceivable that Lula would run again. Yeah. So we'll see. Does his uh, party is, have a majority in the in the Congress? Or? No, the right wing in, in Brazil has a majority, although okay. to call it the right wing is a, is, is a little more complex than it really is because there's a lot of regional parties. There's a lot of centrist parties. So Lula has been able to do some tax reforms. He has been able to increase some spending. He has been able to get through some measures that help. But... He still has a tough fight ahead. Look, these phenomena, and I worry about it a lot, we are seeing the collapse of media systems around the world. Yeah. Seeing the rise of influencers and people believing what they want to believe. And I think the most important thing people could do right now is support independent media outlets like my own Payday Report. Yeah. I think we're the only publication on the left that covered this. Uh, and, and because we have to figure out a way to get out the message. Yeah. Well, we'll start talking regularly again on labor, which we need to do. Um, the last thing, um, if these, is there a trial? Like, will there, do you think there'll be a trial, like kind of in a timely manner? Or what do you think? Yeah, I, I think there will be. I mean, Alexander G. Marais is doing this. You know, he also cracked the uh, the Mary Ellie Franco case. Yeah. And not someone who plays around. Uh, they call him Shandown. Uh, he's an interesting, interesting figure. And I think there are going to be a lot of fights ahead um yeah that's pretty remarkable uh an ex-president and 36 of his uh aides you know his associates and military and political officials were uh, indicted today really pretty remarkable uh and you know uh, as you pointed out an incredible contrast to what's happened here the way trump was just kind of ignored and the democratic party really kind of never really went after him and you know now here we are where he's gets to conduct these vendettas against people who really didn't do anything to him to begin with, you know? So, uh, yeah. Situation. Well, it's always good to talk to you. Um, we'll, uh, like I said, we'll get back together again. We'll talk about uh, some labor issues, but I want to keep talking about this too, because as you pointed out, much of the media, including even the left media, doesn't really focus on a lot of these stories. And I think it's- and really it hurts us as a left, because we don't take strength. I mean, even compared to think about, you know, when you were, uh, you know, much younger there was much more focus on what was happening overseas yeah 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 but, yeah well i mean the entire left too i mean it was kind of a global left for a long time there you know where people kind of saw themselves as part of something bigger you know a bigger global movement uh and you know obviously we don't we don't see that now and you have neoliberals and democrats who are as hawkish as anybody else so um yep. we're seeing that so Anyway, as always, uh, it's good to talk to you. This is Mike Elk, who is the founder and senior labor reporter for Payday Report. It's paydayreport.org, right? Dot com. Paydayreport.com. It is dot com. I'm sorry. Okay. Paydayreport.com. Check it out. Make a donation. You can do a, like a one-time donation. You can become a recurrent donor. You can do a, you know, PayPal kind of thing. Um, it's it's well worth it. You get news here that it, it's really hard to find elsewhere, plus coverage of kind of things that you're not going to hear elsewhere, not just union drives, but, you know, Youngstown, Ohio, stuff like that. So really do appreciate it. And um, we'll, uh, again, we'll talk soon, but uh, it was really great getting this update on what's happening in Brazil. 
and let's hope the good news keeps coming because Lord knows we need it. <laughs> so we'll talk to you again. Take care, Mike. All right. Talk to you later, Mike.